I'm going to be talking to Colin McCarricker from Bloomberg NEF about the article, OPEC and ARC's electric vehicle sales forecasts were way off. Colin, why are some of the modeling uh, that we've seen over the past few years, why have they been uh, so off the mark? I think the single biggest thing is you need to sit down and review what you got right and you got wrong, and you need to be open about it when you do outlooks. And what I've seen, and, and there are different, there are varying degrees of this, but certainly seven or eight years ago, there were a lot of groups saying, putting out really optimistic EV adoption forecasts that said 100% of sales were going to be electric by 2025 or 100% by 2030. And those are just laughably wrong now. We're, we're not going to be near 100% this year. We're certainly not going to be near 100% by 2030 either. And part of it is just those never got revisited. Those never got checked to see what went wrong. There's some more nuance to it than that as well. You could say, look, some groups also put out outlooks around 2020 in Europe, where you saw the fuel economy regulations tighten, the vehicle CO2 emissions tighten. That led to a spike in that year. Some groups then extrapolated those growth curves and said, look, we're going to be really high by um, 2025 or 2030. Really, that was just the regulations tightening. Then growth slowed down again. Now they're tightening again. It goes up in 2025 and 2026. So that's that's part of it on the over-optimistic side is like understanding the policy and how important policy still is for the EV market. This doesn't just go on a hockey stick completely on its own yet in most markets we're still the policy still plays a really important role and some people miss that then on the other side for the groups that were more pessimistic the big thing i think that was missed there is just how quickly batteries were getting better and cheaper and that's something we've spent a lot of time at bloomberg nef from 2010 onwards looking at the learning rate on batteries looking at the fundamental technology advancements that were going on and the cost reductions that we're getting and the manufacturing improvements and saying look something big is happening here this is pushing these vehicles towards cost competitiveness and even there i mean we got something big wrong, which is that we thought the Chinese market would be a policy push market until around 2025. We thought the government target of 20% of vehicle sales being electric in China in 2025 would be hit, but we didn't think it'd be a lot more than that. In reality, consumer, organic consumer demand took off around 2022, and now we're at 50% of sales in China being electric, far, far ahead of what any government targets were aiming for. And again, you do so you can get those inflection points. Um, and we thought that was going to happen about three years later than it did. So we get lots of things wrong too at Bloomberg NEF. But the point is, and the really critical junk factor is to go and look at what you got wrong, be public about it, and try and make it better instead of just sort of burying it. One of the uh, forecasts that I follow most is uh, OPEX. And mm-hmm. they have a key assumption I'd like you to get your opinion on. They think that out to 2050, the global north, so the developed economies, uh, demand for combustion uh, vehicles will fall over time. But they're very bullish on the global south, the emerging economies sticking with oil. But given what China's doing with exports and uh, setting up manufacturing plants in those economies, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, there's two big sort of points of differentiation that we probably have in our outlook with, with OPEC's current outlook. One of them is around just the sheer number of vehicles on the road in the world. So while we have about 1.6 million or billion on the road for passenger vehicles in 2050, I think they have 2.2 in their most recent outlook. So quite a big difference. And they say the majority of those being powered by internal combustion engine driven by um, gasoline and diesel. So that's a, a big assumption. And, and the reason we have a lower number there is we think the combination of urbanization, shared mobility, demographic patterns, all these sorts of things play a bigger role in bringing down the size of the total vehicle fleet. It's about 1.3 billion today. We think it rises to 1.6, but we don't see it rising to 2.2, 2.3 as OPEC does. So that's one. The other thing, the other point of differentiation, I think, comes from this idea of is electrification purely a top-down story or is it a top-down and bottom-up story? And what I mean by that is is it only coming at the premium vehicles and then working its way down to the cheaper vehicles or is it starting at both the bottom and the top at the same time and what we're seeing right now is it is starting at the bottom and the top at the same time so there's this sort of pincher movement that's pincer movement that's going on where you have cheap electric two and three wheeled vehicles you have cheap um, low-cost city cars that are coming in in emerging economies, largely from Chinese manufacturers, uh, but also from some domestic ones as well. And it's that combination of top-down and bottom-up where the real volume of oil displacement and the real volume of internal combustion engine vehicle displacement with electric vehicles comes from. 
The uh, again talking about OPEC, uh, there was an assumption there that climate policies would weaken over time, but in fact, the opposite has happened, hasn't it? Depends where you're sitting. Um, I think in in some places they've tightened. In places like the U.S., though, right now we're seeing a very real rollback, and I think this is why when we try and do our our outlooks, we try and say what is the current policy environment, and what would happen if that stays, but nothing new is added. And I think if you do, uh, if you make an assumption of perpetually tightening um, environmental regulations or perpetually weakening ones, you kind of miss the back and forth that is going to happen here. I think there is going to be steps forward and back. Governments come and go. People's preferences are, whether you like it or not, diverse. Um, and that means that the elected officials they put in place will be diverse and the policies that they enact will as well. So I, I think it's very hard to predict where we're going from a policy point of view. I'd be uncomfortable assuming it gets stronger or weaker. I hope it gets stronger as someone who cares about climate change, who cares about urban air quality, and, and in the case of electric vehicles, affordable, affordable mobility. Um, but you have to be careful with how strong the assumptions you make are on policy. Let's talk about models and how they treat the future, because some models uh, are basically extrapolating from historical data, and they seem to miss the the uh, hockey stick uh, uh, curve that we're seeing with a lot of uh, EV technologies like batteries. Yeah, it's a very tricky one. I, what we do is we're not looking a lot at historical growth rates. To be honest, what we're looking at is addressable market through the economics. And when I when I say the economics is when can an can when can an automaker build and sell an EV for at a competitive price with a similar margin that it could for an internal combustion engine car? Because that's when you get real volume and real push from from the automakers. And when they can do that, that's when you get higher rates of adoption because consumers want them and they are available. You need both that supply and demand part of it. So figuring out that addressable market and looking at what battery costs you need to open up new addressable markets, that's really important. And so I would say that's more important than saying what are what were historical growth rates and, and, and extrapolating those. Colin, thank you very much for this. Thanks, Marco.